Welcome to FCF Tucson, and thank you for visiting our broadcasts. Before we get into this message, we want to let you know that if you have any need for prayer or victories you'd like to share, you can let us know through the links in the video description below. And if you've been blessed by these teachings and would like to help us to reach others, you can securely give by visiting our website or clicking on the link again in the video description below. And lastly, please consider helping us to get this message out by sharing it or sharing our page with your friends and family. It is such an honor for us when you do. Thank you. And now, today's message. Hallelujah. Well, uh, once again, let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3 and Matthew 28. As long as I'm just uh, fathering on you today, I'm going to continue to do so in this little episode. For those of you that are relative newcomers, you, you, uh, some of you that are not newcomers are probably not aware either. But there's generally sort of a, 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 a plan about what we're doing uh, in any given time frame. And this year, not just this last series, but this year, God spoke to us about, I spoke to me, I guess I should own it, but the, <laughs> that uh, this year we were to emphasize three things. And the three are not independent of each other. They build on each other. The first one was personal purity. I say we preached on purity. Some people stayed, some people left. (laughs) Then he said spiritual maturity. We preached on growing up. Some people stayed, some people left. But the purpose was to get to this last one, which is supernatural power. You know, we like all, we, we love it when we see things like that. Amen. When we see healings, we see miracles. And, and we see a few just kind of accidentally over time, don't we? Yeah. I mean, I'd hate to use that term accidentally. But God does stuff because He's so gracious. Amen. But there is a progression in the Scripture uh, that enables us to flow in a greater proportion of the power that He makes available for us. And it begins with getting our personal life right. Amen. None of us are perfect, but I always say, if if, if you're going to stumble, at least stumble in the right direction. Amen. And then secondly, as we grow both individually and corporately, we learn to see things, recognize things, understand things that we couldn't understand before, and therefore we can tap into them. Amen. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is a treatise on that subject of growing into the maturity that allows us to perceive the things of the Spirit as He reveals them to the mature believer. Amen. Start in verse 6 and read forward. You'll get there. But the, or go back and look at the messages on the YouTube channel. The, uh, but the supernatural power aspect uh, we've been talking about for some time now. This is actually the ninth Uh, message along those lines. We want to be the supernatural church that God intends us to be. That church is an aspect of us and not of me. That He doesn't just want me to get up here and prophesy. He doesn't just want me to lay hands on the sick. He wants the body to be the body of Christ. A supernatural church does things supernaturally. We talked about the five basic functions of a church, and that is worship, pray, make disciples, uh, fellowship with one another, and then do evangelism and service. Amen. Amen. We talked about supernatural worship. We talked about supernatural prayer. And today we're going to talk, because both of those, although there, there was an exhortation involved, especially with, with prayer, you know, that we've got to pray. We've got to pray in the Holy Ghost. We've got to pray the power down. We've got to pray uh, in, in ways that God uh, moves through us to establish His presence both in us and in the earth. And, and uh, I think we did a good job on those subjects. But it's, it's easy to get people to shout about that. But today we're going to start talking about supernatural disciples. Making disciples supernaturally. Hallelujah. I'm not sure you're going to like it as well. But we need to understand the ways of the Lord and how things work in the kingdom. 
in the evangelical world, which we're at least marginally part of, we believe that God changes people on an individual basis. That's essentially the, the, the uh, basic premise. And we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. So that qualifies us for most evangelical associations. Right there. The, uh, what we call the Great Commission, uh, most of us are pretty tuned into that. Actually, each one of the Gospels presents a little bit of a different rendition of what we call the Great Commission. I kind of like to put them all together and kind of mold them into one thing. But, but uh, Mark's Gospel is the one that we most often quote, I think, because it's got all the miracles attached to the back end of it. And we kind of like that. We're Pentecostal after all. <laughs> Amen. We want to lay hands on the sick, brother. Okay. Cast out some devils. Let's cast out devils. Yeah. Actually, most people say, you go cast out devils. Come back and tell us how it works. <laughs> Y'all laughing, I'm just telling you. Here, you go have an experience, come tell me about it. The, uh, now, I want you to go have the experience, come tell me about it. Yeah. I did my deal, all right? Okay. The, uh, I mean, we're still doing a little bit along the way. But the, uh, uh, so Mark's gospel is the one where it said, Go into all the world, preach the gospel of every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth and not shall be damned. These signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they'll cast out devil. Right? Blah, blah, blah. All right. Right. So go, preach, believe, saved. We like that one. That's a good one. Luke's got one too, you know. He said, he told them, he said, it's good that uh, repentance and remission of sin be preached to the whole world, but don't leave town <laughs> until you're endued with power from on high. So he said, but we don't like Luke's because we don't like that repentance thing. Do you ever wonder why nobody preaches Luke's Great Commission? Now you know. Because it involves quitting your sin. I'm just telling you. I've been preaching a long time. I, you pick a text that suits what you want to preach on. In this case, I got four choices. I'll take Mark. I like to preach on baptism. I like Mark. Amen. Amen. So, but Luke's is in there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So he said, we've got to preach this repentance and remission of sin to the whole earth and don't go until you're endued with power from on high. Right? So that's Luke's rendition. John's, his is, he snuck his in. It's when he appeared to the disciples after his resurrection. Remember that? In John's gospel? And he told them, I'm sending you just like the Father sent me. Ooh. Yeah, I kind of like his rendition because only one sentence and that's hard to remember. But today we're going to look at, then at Matthew's rendition in chapter 28. Verse 18. Pardon me, 16. Then those who feared the Lord... Oh, I'm in the wrong. There we go. There, that reads better. And Jesus came to them and saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And everybody said, Amen. Okay. So, the mindset of the church changed by the end of the third century, and it really morphed by the end of the sixth century into what we call the clergy and the laity. As a matter of fact, there was a period in church history where they actually taught that there were two different kinds of Christians, basically. There was the priesthood, who were very holy and devout, and committed and lived right. And then there were the rest of you <laughs> who came on Sunday, ate some crackers and juice in the name of the Lord, and we did the best we could to keep you out of hell. But you believed all right, but, you know, just kind of shuffling along. You know, that's when they made up purgatory. Because they knew you weren't going to live right, so they had to place it. Had to, if, you, if you're going to come to church, there had to be, I mean, if you're going to go to hell right away anyway, why bother? 
But to get you to come to church, you got to make sure that there's at least, you know, like a carrot on the stick. So now you don't get to go straight to heaven, but we do have a, you know, a storage spot for you where if, if when, when, you're, when you're there, uh, those of us who are really holy, uh, we can exert our influence and pray you out. That's a very loose statement of that doctrine, but, but it sort of worked that way. But there, there were two classes of Christians. You don't really find that in the New Testament. Unfortunately, we still practice it. Not the purgatory part. But most of our churches, most of our church services, most of our mindset is, I'm going to go watch the holy people on Sunday and send people. I, most people don't want uh, to send missionaries. They want to pay mercenaries to go do what they're supposed to be doing. You know what mercenaries are, right? Paid soldiers. Okay. So, but that uh, differentiation between the laity and the clergy is really not a particularly biblical model. Now, in any church service, including this one, there are many kinds of people in the auditorium. Uh, there's people that I call watchers. They just came to watch. And some of them are genuinely seeking. They have questions. They want to see, you know, they, they came to find out. God bless them. All of us came to find out at one point in time, somewhere along the way. Amen. Some people are, are just genuinely ignorant. Some people have been misinformed by previous encounters with churchianity. Really, I was. I mean, my early experience with church was something less than positive. And yet here I am. Amen. Some people came because their mother made them come. Other people came because uh, their wife made them come. <laughs> Amen. Pressure from family. What, who knows what they're here for? But they're here looking. Right? Uh, and then a little further along the line, you have what Mark talked about. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We call it, they're converts. They have believed, they've professed Jesus as their Lord, but there are, the vast majority of the church is somewhere between convert and disciple. I'm not sure it's a continuum. I think there's a big pool right around convert and then a little trickle that aims over toward the disciple. Convert meaning, I believe all that, I confess all that, something happened to me, I know, and I'm hoping to make heaven when this is done, but I'm not really sure how much I'm willing to do. I would say... 80%? Just because that's the figure that's everything else is 80 20, right? <laughs> They've acknowledged the Lordship of Jesus Christ, but have made a decision about their level of commitment. They nod to God once a week or once a month. Come on. And then there's disciples, John chapter 8. We're familiar with that verse. Verse 31, Jesus said, To those who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. <laughs> if you abide in my word, then you are my real disciples. That's what we've been studying on Tuesday nights. Amen. Somebody or everybody is somewhere in that continuum from watcher to convert to actual disciple. Right? If our commission, certainly we have the commission to preach the gospel and, and see people converted. Praise God. Thank God for that. I'm glad somebody did it to me. Amen. But we're not supposed to stop there. There has to be at least the opportunity for those people to move from convert to disciple. Conversion, I believe, biblically speaking, ought to be taking place out there. I've had people get mad at me because I don't give an altar call for salvation at every service. First of all, there are a lot of services where I know everybody in the room. I led half of them to the Lord myself. I, don't, I know they're not coming. <laughs> and I'm not that guy that is going to give this altar call. And for those of you who maybe there's anything in your life that's not 
right with God this week. If you've done any, if you spit on the sidewalk, come forward because Jesus comes, you're going to hell. No, you're not. My wife catches you, you might. <laughs> or wish you had. <laughs> Eugene liked that one. Isn't it? <laughs> Amen. I, I don't give those altar calls. Anybody in here that's ever experienced fear? Hello? I was afraid you were going to give an altar call like that just this morning. Which means now I've got to lie to not come, right? Amen. But we're supposed to be discipling people in the church, converting people in the street. It's just my reading of the Bible. You can test it out yourself. But everybody here today is somewhere on that continuum. Amen. The process of becoming a disciple, he talks about in Matthew 28. It's, to me, it's just so clear but not to everybody, so we'll explain a little bit of it. Because I, I want to make sure you understand uh, what we're talking about. Jesus said in verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Wow, that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? And then the next thing he says is, therefore, you go. <laughs> the Lord of the universe said, here's the plan. This is how we are going to expand the kingdom in the earth. I could come riding on the white horse right now and just tear stuff really up. <laughs> but here's my plan formulated with the Father and the Holy Spirit before the foundations of the world. There will be a time between my first coming and my second coming when the kingdom shall be expanded one believer at a time through the mechanism of the church. Amen. For those of you that uh, read such things, that the theologians refer to it very accurately as the church age. <laughs> Amen. So, you go, therefore, and make disciples of every nation. You go irrespective of races, irrespective of nations. You know, when Jesus said this, there really wasn't so much a thing as what we call nations now. I mean, the, the, the nation state as we understand it now is really a relatively new phenomenon starting in about the 1500s, really. So that they would have understood this as races and tribes. They wouldn't have understood it as countries like we do. All the world. He placed the plan for the earth in the hands of the church. Now certainly we see from Mark and we see from Luke that part of the plan is making converts. Go preach the gospel. They that believe will. They that don't won't. Amen. The gospel is simply that Jesus came, he died on the cross for your sin, he was buried, he was raised again the third day. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father, a whole bunch of people saw him and we can prove it. 1 Corinthians 15, in case you missed the last 57 times I preached that. <laughs> Make converts. But here in Matthew 28, he makes it clear, we're also supposed to be looking at making disciples. Di Converts are the raw material for disciples. You can't make a disciple until they're a convert. Not of Jesus, anyway. Where he says make disciples here, he uses the, uh, the Greek word is mathetes, is the, the root word. It means a follower of somebody else's doctrine. And uh, reading from... from uh, Zodiates commentary on the New Testament, mathetuo, which is the, to make disciples, it means to instruct with the purpose of making a disciple. It means not only to learn, but to become attached to one's teacher and to become his follower in doctrine and conduct of life. Amen. To become attached to one's teacher and become a follower of his doctrine in manner of conduct and life. Well, that's a step up from convert, isn't it? Yes, Amen. So how does that work exactly? Well, he explains it, I think, uh, very lucidly here. He says, you do it, number one, by baptizing them. 
baptizing them. We're not talking about magical baby baptizing. That's what infant baptism is, you realize. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sprinkle the magic water on you, and it will turn you into a Christian. Shazam. I mean, the people that, when they started doing that, they, they were sincere, but sincerely wrong. But there's a whole, I mean, that's a whole other deal. But, but uh, and when people got the revelation that we ought to go back to doing it like they did in the New Testament, it really made the other people mad, and so people got killed over it. But baptizing them means being immersed in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost after you have believed in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. So, baptizing them. So what is the significance of baptizing? Baptism, baptism doesn't save you. Amen. Just because you got wet does not make you a Christian. Amen. You, get, you become a Christian, then you get wet on purpose. Why? Because it is your moment of identification. Amen. It's rejecting your old affiliation and being received into a new affiliation. Romans chapter 6, the fourth, third and fourth verse, tells us that we were buried with Christ through baptism into death. Yeah. Amen. We were raised with Him to walk in new life. It's the place where we identify our life with His life and accept His life as our life. Amen. Everybody say identification. identification. I got tickled. We were out in the foyer. Uh, much earlier this morning, and, and Wayne's phone rang. Now, when Wayne's phone rings, it goes da 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 bum bum ba bum 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 ba bum 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 ba bum bum. I immediately came to attention. Didn't have to. I didn't know what it was. I just knew somebody's playing Boomer Sooner. I bet I sang that more than I sang the national anthem. <laughs> Amen. The verse is very complicated. Boomer sooner, boomer sooner, boomer sooner, boomer sooner. <laughs> Amen. But the bridge is where the real power of the identification comes in. It says, I'm sooner born and sooner bred, and when I die, I'll be sooner dead. Ra, Oklahoma, Ra, Oklahoma, Ra, Oklahoma, okay, you. I wish I could get that kind of commitment from the church. <laughs> You're laughing. I'm serious. It, it drives me nuts that people won't serve the Jesus that died for them. Amen. Amen. And all I have to do is hear that song, and I'm, yeah, let's go find somebody from Nebraska and whoop them. Or at least sneak up to Stillwater and put red dye in the fountain. <laughs> Stillwater's Oklahoma State, so we lovingly refer to them as Aggies. You know. <laughs> What's your point? There's an identification there. It's, you know, I don't have to think about it, it's just who I am. Yeah. Amen. You don't have to tell me what song that is, it just goes, <laughs> Amen. That's what identification means. It becomes who you are. Amen. That's what baptism is about. His life is your life. Your life is His life. It's about commitment. Luke 14, 33. This was one of the attractions of the early church. People came and got saved because they saw the commitment of these lunatics that were following this guy. They said, I don't know what this is about, but these people have something genuinely to live for, and maybe more importantly, they're willing to die for. I mean, all you got to do is just say, oh no, I don't follow Jesus, I follow Caesar. They won't say it. The Roman soldiers got saved in droves when they were ordered to kill Christians. 
And the Christian died singing hymns of praise to Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Soldiers dropped their weapons and said, Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Why? Because they saw something. Yes. It may look nutty, but man, these people must know something that I don't know. <laughs> Luke 14, you there yet? end of it. If you want to get challenged, if you want to, I don't know what y'all say in Arizona, but in Oklahoma, we say, if you need to check your whole card, yeah. see, I mean, see what you really got. Read Luke 14 once a day for about a week. This is commitment chapter. This is over, under, sink, or swim, live, or die. I'm in chapter. And he closes with these verses. Verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Didn't catch an amen on that one, did I? This is one of the first chapters that I became obsessed with when I started reading my Bible on my own because nobody ever preached on it. The only thing they preach out of this chapter, usually, is the, the one that says, well, don't do anything without counting the cost. It's right before this. And that's not what he was teaching in that passage, by the way. That's horrible exegesis. What he was teaching was, don't count the cost. If God told you to do something, you do it no matter what it costs. It always costs exactly the same thing, everything you have. The cost of following Jesus, the, the price is always exactly the same, everything. And then he broke this verse. I mean, you've got to have help to misunderstand it. We've had plenty of help. He goes on to say in verse 34. Let's read it in context so we get the flow. Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I would posit to you that one of the reasons, not the only reason, let me not be too mean, but the reason most of the world looks at the church and says, eh, it's right there in that verse. When salt has lost its savor, men throw it out. What's he talking about when he's talking about savor in this passage? He's talking about the commitment that says, I forsake all to follow Jesus. I'm a disciple. I told you you weren't going to like me today. So, discipleship begins with an all-in commitment yes. to follow God. Yes. Amen. Amen. And then he says, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples who have been with him for three and some odd, three, three years and a few months, uh, walking around listening to every sermon all the way through, laying hands on the sick. They've gone out and cast out devils. They've done the whole nine yards. This is on the other side of Calvary. Amen. They've, they've gone through the, the death, the burial, and now he's standing there in front of them in the resurrection. <laughs> you know, so, so these are guys that have heard all the commandments. He says, I'm teaching... Teach them, teach these disciples to observe all things that I commanded you. Amen? The word observe. <laughs> translated many different ways. Some people translated keep. Some people translated obey. Whatever translation you've got probably has a little different uh, twist on it. Because observe means like, you know, like you go to the movies and, right? I mean, the, the way we normally take that, but we also talk about observing Passover, wasn't it? We're keeping the feast, right? 
And, and it's used sort of in that way here. The word observe means to guard, to protect, to keep your eyes on. I don't want you to just do it. I don't want you to just observe it and go through the motions. I want you to make the things that I have commanded you to do the absolute center of your life. Yes. Most people have a checklist. I did my devotions. I paid my tithe. I went to church three out of four Sundays. I'm good. Come on. And we, we're guilty of giving it to them. You know, and people come to me and say, what do I need to do in order to enhance my Christian life? Well, you need to have daily devotion. <laughs> I mean, I've got a list I can give you. But I can't see your heart. Amen. And you can do that checklist all you want to, but it won't change you unless that's why you're there. Not a checklist, but it's a lifestyle. The idea is to keep the commandments of the Lord in the center of their attention. All things he commanded them. I, I won't say that I have found every possible interpretation of that phrase, but if you go through the, the Gospels, he didn't just walk around commanding people to do stuff all the time. There was only one or two really places where he stopped and said, I'm commanding you to do this. This is my commandment that you love one another. A new commandment I have given you that you love one another. Yeah, he was kind of a, you know, one-trick pony, wasn't he, when it came to commandments. Really. <laughs> yeah, I, I went back through the Gospels. I probably missed some things, but... The only one I could find where he said, this is what I'm commanding you to do is what? Love one another. So all things that I've commanded you to do would be what? Love one another. And then number two, he was in the middle of commanding them to do something. What? Go. <laughs> I want you to love one another. Talk, talking to the disciples. Love one another. And then what? Go. Go. Those are the two commandments that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to his disciples after his resurrection. Love one another. Go preach. The whole point is he wants us to be like him. The, the, the two uh, scriptures that come to my mind is in John chapter 13. Let's look at that. And then we'll hit the punchline. John chapter 13. It, this, you know, I'll be honest with you. I've preached on the Great Commission. I've preached on disciples. I mean, for the last, what, how many weeks on Tuesday night we've been teaching on disciples, yeah. Amen. I got John 8, 31 emblazoned on the back of my tongue. I don't say it anymore. I just open my mouth and let people read it. But I can't tell you. I mean, I've been doing this nearly 40 years. I don't know how many times. Lots. And I never really saw this with the kind of impact in the way that it hit me this week. When I was looking at just those two commandments, and I looked at the two passages where he commanded it, and he said here, he said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. As I have have loved you. What was the commandment? It wasn't just love. It was love like I do. Love like I do. Well, I, I, I've seen that before. I understand that. We've even talked a little bit about that over time. But then the second one, there's two places we could go, but let's go to John 20. John 20. This was after the resurrection, once again, on resurrection day, as a matter of fact. He walked into the room, freaked him smooth out. Yeah. I love that story. I, just, I, just, I try to picture myself being there. Uh -huh. <laughs> you like to think you'd be really cool, but I know you wouldn't. You know. <laughs> Pass right out. 
Verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. He already said peace to you once. And of course they freaked out. So he had to say peace to you again. <laughs> when Jesus walks through the wall and you just saw him die three days before, you know, peace may not be the first thing that you react with when you see him come in the room. Peace to you. Now listen to this. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. He said, I want you to love one another as I have loved you, and I want you to go as the Father has sent me. What's the striking thing to, to you about that? What struck me was he has commanded us to act like him. I want you to love like me. I want you to go like me. The whole point of discipleship, dear friends, is that we should be like Jesus. Acts chapter 11, is a, a, you don't have to turn there, but uh, Paul and, and Barnabas were, were at Antioch. Gentiles were getting saved. Nobody knew what to do about that. Barnabas saw it, went up and got Saul from Tarsus, brought him back. And uh, there they were teaching large crowds of people. And in Acts eleven twenty six, 26, it says, it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Now, I think it's safe to say that it wasn't the Jews that called them Christians because the Jews, no way a good Jew is going to call anybody else a little Messiah because that's what that means. It was probably the Gentiles that started calling them Christians. That means people that act like the Messiah or followers of the Messiah. And I, I read that again this week and I thought, I wonder what people call us. If they use the term Christians, my guess is they don't mean it the same way those people did. And I just asked myself this question, what are they calling me? Luke 6, 40. The Lord Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, say everyone, everyone, who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Everyone who is perfectly trained. The, the, the Greek word there for perfectly trained is the same word that's translated perfected or equipped over in Ephesians 4.12 where it talks about the function of the fivefold ministry. It's to perfect. It's to equip. He who is perfectly trained and equipped will be like his teacher. Our goal in discipleship is to become more like Jesus every day. Yes. To love like Him. Yes. To go like Him. If being like Jesus is not your goal, you're not a disciple yet. Yes, it's time to do a goal adjustment. Amen. John chapter 8 said, uh, those that abide in my word are my disciples indeed. Remember that? He said, when you do that, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Abiding in his word, hungering for the word of God is not an intellectual exercise. It's a passion for the life of God to work in us, to transform us, to make us genuinely free, and to transform us into His image. If that's not what we're shooting for, we're aiming at the wrong target. We're not here to make heaven. We're here to represent Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, he said, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. It's not just about growing so we can be better parents. It's not just about growing so we can be nicer people. It's not just about growing so that we can experience a business success. It's about growing into the image of Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians 3, let's look there. It 
2 Corinthians 3. End of the chapter. Verse 18. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are being transformed. Now, uh, without uh, necessarily turning there, James chapter 1 calls the Word of God our mirror. When we look into the mirror of the Word, if we're open to this, if we desire it, then God will, by His Spirit, use His Word to transform us into the image of of Jesus Christ. If you're reading the Word just to get your, your devotional done for the day, don't. When you get in whatever you call your devotional time, enter there with the idea that I am being transformed into the image of Jesus. Father, show me what I can do this day to move in that direction. Make the adjustments with your word and your spirit on the inside of me that make me more loving like Jesus, that empower me and impel me to go like Jesus. Lord, transform me today. You remember Matthew chapter 10. Jesus called his disciples, called the 12 to him. He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Disciples come to Him, and when they come to Him with their heart right and their attitude right, He empowers them to go just like He did. Not to come to church and have a blessed service, but to go cast out devils, lay hands on the sick. Let's look in John 15 and we'll quit. Once again, this is the abiding in the vine passage. Most of you are familiar with that part of it. Some of you are familiar with verse 7 because you use it for prayer for Scripture. But I want to hook this on to what we've been talking about this morning. Verse 7. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, You may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. Stop there for just a minute. He's not talking about your new Cadillac. I mean, I'm all in favor of you getting a new Cadillac, as long as you bless your preacher along the way. Amen. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about abiding in the vine, drawing your life from the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you want. What's he saying? He's saying, if you do that, then I won't have to worry about what you're going to ask for. I would go so far as to say this. If you are abiding in him and his words are abiding in you, then what you're going to ask for is, Lord, help me to love like you. Lord, help me to go like you. He said, you can ask whatever you want. Want because your want will be in line with my want. Why? Because you are like me. Then he says, When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. Another one of them disciple verses right there in the next verse. When you produce much fruit, then you're my true disciples. And this brings great glory to my Father. Amen. So what's discipleship about? It's about getting to be like Jesus. Being transformed to love like Him and to go like Him so that you can produce fruit like Him and the Father will be glorified. Let's stand up. I don't know if you got anything, but I got happy. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we bless you, Jesus, and praise you. Bless you, Jesus, and praise you. Bless you, Jesus, and praise you. Gorra baha shike tembrofa katabesike. Mumbro ho shike tembrafa. Hahara bosko robofo. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay. Bow your heads for just a moment. I'm just kind of obeying what drops in my spirit, so y'all just bear with me. The, uh, I keep getting stuck on that go into, make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all. I'm not talking about your travel itinerary here. I'm talking about people that maybe you're not comfortable going to. Whether it's a racial issue, whether it's a cultural issue. That's one of those ropes that needs to get cut. Hallelujah. I'm going to be just perfect, perfectly transparent, can I? I, I grew up in, the, in a time and in a place uh, where racism was just part of the culture. I didn't know any better, just where I lived, you know what I'm saying? It uh, didn't seem right somehow, but, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and I, kn I knew from a natural standpoint, it didn't make any sense, you know. And, and so you tried not to, you tried not to, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I knew I shouldn't, so I tried not to. <laughs> then I got saved. And the Lord has the most amazing sense of humor. <laughs> the, the first guy that actually sat with me with the scriptures and discipled me uh, was a black guy. I love that man. <laughs> And then the, the first person the Lord sent me to uh, minister to, along those same lines, another black guy. <laughs> so now here we are, We're like an Oreo cookie. <laughs> I'm the white, sweet sinner. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Uh, God changed things on the inside of me. Amen. I mean, big time. Amen. You just have to, to, to take my word for it. Something happened. And then he, the first place I ever went overseas, where did he send me? Haiti. I remember walking down the sidewalk looking around thinking, I'm going to have a hard time hiding here. <laughs> I'm a foot taller than everybody else and the wrong color. I'm in trouble. Amen. It's funny when you open yourself up and ask the Lord to change you. <laughs> he does. Come on. But I'm just telling, I'm, te I'm telling you that because I just know because God had me come back to this. There's some, I'm not talking about necessarily black and white or, or Hispanic and green. I don't know what the, uh, but there's, there's some people here today that need to cut that rope. To let go of your assumptions. You know what an assumption is? That's a fancy word for prejudice about other people. Come on. You know the one thing I can tell you uh, about other people that is absolutely true. I learned from Kermit the Frog. <laughs> he said, people is people. You need to bear that in mind. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, bow your heads. I'm just going to give you a moment to pray. If there's a rope you need to cut, because it's going to keep you from going and making disciples of all nations. whether that's next door or whether that's across the world. Whew. Thank you, 
anymore. While we have our heads bowed, let me ask this. If you came this morning and you've never made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, He's just as alive today as He was that day that He walked through the wall and talked to those disciples. I know it because I read it in the Word, but I also know it because I had a chat with Him this morning. Every day of the world. Every day of the world. I check in with the home office. He's still alive. He's still alive. If you're here today and you've never uh, made that first step in following the Lord by uh, simply offering your life to Him and making that confession, that great confession, Jesus Christ is my Lord, then we'd like to pray with you before you go. If that's you, you need to follow God and you need to begin by making a commitment to Jesus Christ. Would you lift your hand and wave at me? Before we go, I want to pray with you. I'll make sure I didn't know everybody today. I'm talking in my sermon about not giving an altar call and then give an altar call. It's just how I am. Get used to it. Amen. Amen. Man, I still got something in my heart and don't know what it is. It don't seem like we're quite done yet. Somebody else got something? something jumping up and down in here, but I don't have a clarity of what it is. Thank you, Jesus. And God is so good. Is so good. God is so good. You're so good, Lord. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Sing that again. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Huh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Yeah, but one word just keeps popping in my spirit, and it's potential. 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 Don't look at your potential. Look at his potential. Amen. There's a lot more potential in you than you know about because you're looking at your potential. Amen. His potential is inside of you. Don't shortchange it. Don't shortchange it. Don't shortchange it, but you're going to have to learn how to live in it and to walk in his potential and not in yours. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for these precious ones came out on a Sunday. I thank you, Father God, that they are disciples indeed because they continue in your word. I commit them to your care. They're your kids. Watch over them carefully in Jesus' name. Amen. Get some coffee.